Okay, future nurses, here we go. Let's get done with another chapter. We are still on unit three, and now we are down to chapter seven. And chapter seven is nursing management of pain during labor and birth. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about childbirth classes. Childbirth classes are available to expected mothers and fathers, and you can look that up. It's within your book. It lists some types of prenatal classes, and it is thought that if you have a mom who has gone to childbirth classes or prenatal classes, um, that will help her to um, handle her pain a little bit better, and that's simply because she is more informed. Um, often, the content of this class also gives benefits of exercising and pain control methods, such as massage, diversion, and breathing technique, and all of these aid in the mom um, pain management. A lot of times now, the newer school moms, they've seen things on YouTube, or they're doing some type of uh, prenatal yoga, where they're teaching these massage techniques, and all of this help for mothers who may not want to use pain medication um, during their labor at all or at the very beginning. Uh, childbirth pain versus other pain, it is quite different. The, it is a normal part of the birthing process, like they're going to experience some pain. The woman has several months to prepare and um, the pain rapidly declines after the birth. Not to say that she will not have some pain after the birth, but it rapidly declines from the intensity of the pain she had during the birth. There are factors that influence pain, the patient's pain threshold, that's how the patient uh, pain is perceived, and pain tolerance, that's the amount of pain that one is willing to endure. The nurse's responsibility is to modify as many factors as possible so the woman can tolerate her pain during labor. And gate control theory, I want you guys to remember this, that states that the pain is transmitted through small diameter nerve fibers. The technique to close the gate includes massaging um, and some heat therapy and cold therapy. Please make sure that you remember that. I need you to know what gate control theory states. Now, there are some sources of pain um, during labor. It is the dilation, which is the stretching of the cervix, uh, the reduced uterine blood supply during contractions, the pressure of the fetus on the pelvic structures, and stretching of the vagina and the perineum. These are what are the uh, areas, the sources of the pain during the labor. The factors that modify pain and physical um, we do like to do a lot of massaging, applying pressure to the areas in which she says hurt, like on her uh, back, a lot of time it's her lower back, or gripping something to interfere with pain impulses, um, and that's what they consider a part of the gate control theory. Um, just a little bit about me, my husband used to say that I was a, a bed, uh, bed rail rattler, and evidently that was a part of the uh, gate control theory because it was something about me grabbing the bedside rails as hard as I could during a contraction. Um, it really did help. So uh, there must be some truth to that. Um, please make a note of this. Other factors can be uh, naturally occurring such as a release of endorphins. Um, and that's a, a substance that's similar to morphine. It is produced by your very own body. And endorphins release peak during labor for moms. So some of the other um, sources of pain during labor is unfortunately when we have to stick our moms for um, a blood draw or when we have to do um, IV line placements, uh, an am uh, amniotomy, which that's when we break the... Um, rupture the membranes artificially, or when we do a vag exam on a patient because they're already uh, very tender, and so we're doing these um, multiple vag exams while they have all this already, their cervix is stretching and things like that, that can cause some pain. And placement of monitors, especially if we're doing internal monitors, that could be uh, painful for the patient. Some cultural influences dealing with the pain. Cultural influences how a woman will react to the pain during childbirth. 
uh, for example, uh, Hispanic women and Asian women uh, react in a what we like to call a stoic manner and that is not all the way true for everybody like we say we like to be culturally sensitive if we see it but that does not mean that everybody's going to fall within the same group or within the same uh, realm of this sometimes uh, they will never ask for pain medicine it's seen as a weakness to some uh, people in that culture, other cultures such as Indian culture, the woman is expected to be uh, pain-free during the whole process. Um, and we know for a fact that she is not pain-free, but sometimes the thought process of this is just what it is and this is not hurting me, it's a natural process, is what gives them the idea, the thought that it is a pain-free process. Um, so it is best for you to get to know your patient and their culture Ask for pain control measures up front so you will know how they want to manage the pain. That may change during the course of their labor, but if you ask at the very beginning, at least you know kind of where they are, what they're thinking about, and make sure that you know a patient's pain is uh, of their own. You cannot grade their pain for them, and no one else in the room can grade their pain for them, and no one else in the room can speak for them when it comes to their pain control because you will notice that that will happen sometimes it happens in the situations when you're dealing with uh young mothers uh teenage pregnancies you will have where their mother or someone in the room will decide for them hey they don't need an epidural they don't need pain medicine so maybe they won't end up right back here you know you hear those kind of things and no she needs to feel this so that she'll know better next time she's not going to know better next time it doesn't matter um and it's not helping the situation it can make her labor harder it can make her labor longer okay so um there are advantages to non uh pharmacology uh pharmacology uh methods of pain control if the pain control is adequate um, there's no harm to the fetus, and it does not slow down the labor, um, such as um, uh, relaxation techniques and skin stimulation, positioning, uh, diversions, distractions, imagery, breathing techniques. These are what we call non-pharmacological pain management. Okay, and it doesn't slow down anything. Um, the outcome is always better if these methods are rehearsed before the actual onset of labor. This is not something that you want to start trying to do right when she goes into labor and you're trying to think, okay, well, you know, we saw this on a series of friends or something. Let's breathe with the contractions. Like, that's not going to work. That's not going to do anything but upset the patient and frighten the patient and make it worse for her. So all of these techniques that we we just discussed um, should be uh, taught prior to the actual onset of labor. This is also noted on box 7-1 within this chapter um, under uh, non-pharmacological pain relief measures. Um, the relaxation technique is just as it suggests a skin stimulation and that is stimulating nerve fibers by stroking the skin and that does help for some people, just long, even strokes of the skin. Now, that ain't going to work for everybody because some people are going to be like, don't touch me. Um, stop rubbing me. Okay, that's because their nerve endings are not dealing with that real well at the time. But sometimes that could help. Uh, sacral pressure, and that is when you firmly press on the lower back, and this helps to relieve um, pain of back labor. I need you guys to make sure that you know this one. Uh, sacral pressure is when they are firmly applying pressure to the lower back and that helps to relieve the pain of back labor. Highlight it, make a note, make flashcard, whatever it is that you need to do. But I need you to know that and I need you to know what type of pain management that falls under, which is none pharmacological pain management okay so and then we have thermal <clears throat> stimulation and that is applying heat to reduce the pain positioning and that is repositioning the patient um, to help her um, maintain some comfort 
diversions and distractions. Uh, this kind of involves the use of a focal point or concentration. Uh, that helps. Some people will even use diversion like um, playing games, word games, something they will have to concentrate on. Um, imagery is another one, and that is creating a peaceful place in the mind, you know, imagining imagery, imagining a place. Uh, music works really well for uh, relaxation. Uh, television also works well as a diversion. And then, of course, a breathing technique. Um, please make a note that gate control theory, um, I want you to know the definition. So it is stimulating the large diameter nerve fibers temporarily and it interferes with conduction of impulses through a small diameter fiber. Massage is a technique that stimulates large diameter fibers and closes the gate. It's the nurse's role to minimize environment irritants, such as uh, dimming the light and promoting other comfort measures, making sure her bed stays nice and dry and comfortable, uh, make sure that the door stays closed. Um, if she likes sunlight, make sure that you're allowing light in her room. If that's too much, making sure her curtains stay drawn and also paying attention to um, the effects of the family on the patient um, to make sure that the people that are in there are helping her and not hindering her or not um, stressing her, uh, but good vibes only. And promoting relaxation during contractions will also help to reduce the intensity of the pain. So um, my cue for this, and I need you to make a note that promoting relaxation during the contraction will help to reduce the intensity of the pain, um, is that if you have, um, let's do two little scenarios. If you have a patient who is having a contraction and then there's somebody in the room who's saying things like, oh, here it comes. Here comes another contraction. Oh, it's about to really go to the top now. Okay, now that's uh, increasing her stress. And then she is getting uh, tenser and tighter and she's not embracing the contraction. She's wanting to fight it. She's going to want to tense up to fight the contraction. But the second scenario, if you are there and you are the nurse or you educate the family, once they see the contraction coming, that they start saying positive, reinforcing things to relax her, like, okay, now go ahead and take a deep breath and let it out. Okay, now just go ahead and keep breathing. Stay with me. Like, just stay with me. Using a nice and relaxing and a calming voice as that throughout the contraction, saying things that are relaxing to her, then that will help her get through that contraction a little bit better and it will reduce the intensity of the pain. Okay, so um, let's talk about the um, three methods of preparation. So we have the Dick Red method and that uses relaxation technique and um, the Bradley method, and that's the husband, coach, childbearing, child um, emphasizes relaxation and technique of the breathing. Um, also, we have another method of preparation, which is Lamaze. Um, and Lamaze is the, um, um, it uses mental relaxation and uh, breathing techniques. So let's see here. Let's talk a little bit about the um, uh, Lamaze. So Lamaze really teaches a lot of slow, deep breathing. And the breathing should be no slower than a half of the baseline rate. It uses a lot of mental relaxation along with the breathing techniques and a lot of Lamaze classes do help, but do I believe that the Lamaze classes are the only uh, method of preparation that we should use? Um, everybody's different. It works for some, but not, may not work for all. 
Okay, now with the Bradley method, that is the husband coach childbirth. It emphasizes relaxation and breathing technique as well. It's really guided by the husband or the coach to try to kind of just follow along with the patient. And the Dick Red method, it uses relaxation techniques as well, but it focuses on decreasing fear and tension. Um, so those are the difference between the three techniques. So um, with the breathing technique, each breathing pattern begins and ends with the cleansing breath. So the first stage of breathing is the slow pace breathing, and that is deep and slow and it's in between contractions. Then we have the modified pace breathing, and that is more rapid and shallow, and it's during contractions, rapid and shallow. And then we will have the pattern-based breathing, and that is the he-who breathing in transition phase that people hear about, where you see it on TV and you're all like, <laughs> you don't even really see a lot of that in labor and delivery, but I do find it very funny when I watch shows and they do that breathing throughout the whole person's labor. Um, but there are difference in breathing patterns and why you're doing those breathing patterns. Now, all of those are in the first stage. Now, let's talk about the second, second stage of breathing. That takes, uh, you of course, take a cleansing breath, then they we teach them to exhale, then take another deep breath, and then push while counting to 10. Now that is during the pushing phase. The second stage of breathing is during the uh, pushing stage and you need always to have that cleansing breath so that they can release um, that breath and then take another deep breath and hold it. So the reason that they're taking that deep breath in and exhaling it out is so that they can grab another deep breath in and hold that breath while somebody is uh, counting to 10. They're not counting because you can't talk and hold your breath and push at the same time. Um, the patient will become tired if she begins um, using any of these breathing methods before it's really needed. She will become exhausted. And so we really want to wait until these methods are needed. Uh, please make a note of this. Um, hyperventilation can be a problem when the woman is breathing very rapidly. Sometimes they'll breathe very, very rapidly, uncontrollably, and you just have to grab their attention and say, we're okay, we're good, everything is going great. Just slow down your breathing, breathe with me, and if you start breathing, taking some nice slower breaths and you engage with that patient and say, breathe with me, a lot of times they will be captivated and then they will slow down their breathing other than somebody screaming at them like, stop doing that, like, get a bag, get a paper bag, you know, all this kind of stuff, you know, you can really help them slow down their breathing. Um, signs and symptoms of them hyperventilating are things like they may feel dizziness, tingling, they could have numbness around their mouth and their fingers, um, and they will have uh, contracted hands and fingers. They may be um, looking and feeling a little bit tense. The nurse should have the woman breathe in a, a small paper bag if she cannot regain uh, control of her slowing down quite um, fast. Um, or into their cupped hands. Um, a lot of times in labor and delivery, we do not have paper bags just lingering about. Um, I do know that in some birthing centers and for people who are uh, planning on delivering at home, this is one of the things that's normally on that list, like a lunch size paper bag. Uh, but other than that, we teach them to just cup their hands and breathe into their hands. And that works just as well. Um, and then you will also at the same time encourage them to slow down their breathing, ex uh, especially during the exhalation portion of the breathing. If the woman feels that she has the urge to push before the cervix is fully dilated, like you and I discussed before, she should be taught to blow short breaths to avoid bearing down um, in order to make sure that she does not swell her cervix up or... Uh, to make sure that she doesn't have any lacerations of her cervix by pushing prematurely. Uh, because the honest truth is, is that you can't blow out a candle and push at the same time. Like, you guys can literally try it. Like, 
try to blow like and push like you're trying to push something out at the same time it can't happen it won't happen which is why we say blow like you're blowing out a candle we're basically telling them blow short breaths but it's easier to give them a, a point of reference other than say blow short breaths you say something like okay blow like you're blowing out a candle that is blowing short breaths it is something that they can identify with that's how i speak to my patients in order for them to do that in order for them to not bear down so that's a little nugget for y'all right there um go to uh, table 7-1 and it talks about intrapartum uh analgesics and uh related drugs i want you guys to look at that uh, as we talk about uh, pharmacological pain medication, um, there are a few um, analgesics and adjunctive drugs um, that you're going to note there. And there's some regional analgenics and anesthetics that we're going to speak about. And then also general anesthesia. So um, let's talk about analgesics um, as far as they are um, systemic. So they are systemic, they affect the entire body and they reduce pain without loss of consciousness. Uh, but the patient is made MPO at this time to prevent aspiration. So um, with anesthetics, this can cause a loss of sensation. Like, um, numbness or no feeling in their lower half uh regional anesthetics is a block of sensations for a localized area without causing a loss of consciousness and a general anesthetic uh, they are also systemic and they cause loss of consciousness and loss of sensation so the risk of narcotic analgesics is that they cross the placenta and they can cause respiratory uh, depression in the fetus. This is most likely if the drug is administered shortly before birth. So this is something that I do uh, want you guys to make sure that you make a note of. Please make a note that the risk of narcotic analgesics is that they do cross the placenta line and they can cause respiratory depression of the fetus and it is more likely to happen <clears throat> if it is administered shortly before birth we if we know that this can occur we will have narcan ready and available in order to give the baby to reverse the effects of that so here's my example for you for that if I have a patient and she is laboring and I am giving her a narcotic analgesic the order would state after eight centimeters for the most part she can no longer have that med I tell my patient that right off the cuff after about eight centimeters whatever it is I'm giving her state all thinner again the doctor is going to state that you can't have any of that, okay? But hence, put in there whatever narcotic uh, analgesic you might have given that patient. Because if you give it to her and she goes from 8 to complete within an hour or 30 minutes and then that baby is born, that baby will have a likelihood of being born looking like a deer in the headlights. Their eyes are just like... Not breathing, not moving, and you're like, mm, Narcan, okay, let's go ahead and help this kid um, because the medication has crossed placenta line and it has not had enough time to work out of the baby system. Now, let's talk about some advantages of uh, farm me methods. It can increase the woman's participation during the birth. It can help her relax and it will help her be able to work better with her contractions. For a lot of people and limitations of pharmacological methods is that 
You have to remember that there are two people being medicated, the mom and the baby, so you need to be ready at all times, pay attention to your monitor strip. It may slow down the progression of labor for the mom, and it may increase adversely uh, with other meds that the mother is taking. So those are some of the, of giving it. A narcotic uh, or opioid uh, analgesics, they are usually considered at risk for neonatal uh, respiratory depression if given within one hour of birth, like we just discussed before. The most commonly used for labor uh, analgesic, analgesia in the US are narcotic analgesics, and it is used in small doses to avoid fetal res uh, respiration depression, and it is avoided if the birth is expected within an hour as we just recently discussed on why that is. Okay, so let me explain to you why we keep Narcan on hand. Narcan is used to reverse respiratory depression caused by opioid drugs. That's what Narcan does. If needed, it can be given to the newborn immediately after birth via the umbilical cord vein. Um, it is used uh, in chronic drug-dependent women and it can cause withdrawals because of its reversing effect of the drug. It isn't effective against other causes of respiratory distress, such as hypoxia or non-opioid drugs. So here's when I kind of tell the little story about um, a situation that I was in, and the doctor screamed, get Narcan, get Narcan, and the nurse I was working with was like, Narcan ain't gonna help this. This rest, this distress is not due to an opioid uh, medication we gave this mom. And so um, I just need you guys to know why we use Narcan. What does Narcan do? Okay. Now let's talk about some adjunctive drugs. Um, these enhance pain relieving actions of the analgesia. Um, for example, given an anti-anxiety along with a narcotic for pain. This is not normal practice, but it does happen at times. Um, use, um, we used to give Finnergan with Demerol or Finnergan with Stadol, but some say it's not a common practice anymore, but I'm going to tell you guys what. <laughs> There's a lot of people that still really do it. Um, and when they give these two meds together, I'm going to tell you what happens. Um, if you get Finnergan and Stadol together or Finnergan and Demerol together, what's going to happen is, is, um, uh, you're going to fall asleep and the nurse will be able to help you and position you and you will become relaxed and then your anxiety level comes down. I honestly have seen people go from you know a uh, horrendous labor to laboring almost effortless just from giving them um state all and finnegan they can work with their body a little bit better they are more relaxed um they still have some pain but it's very much under their control and they will deliver seamlessly um so i still see it used but um, some of the newer school um, doctors are just saying give the epidural but when you have some moms who are stating like no I don't want the epidural um, then that's kind of the method that we like to uh, still fall back on the nurse's role during the use of analgesics or anesthesia or anesthetics is to monitor the status of the mom and to monitor the status of the fetus uh, during the entire process. So let's talk about regional anesthetics and anesthesia. Usually it involves the use of anesthetics in the epidural or the subacnoid space. Um, analgesic blocks pain, anesthetics block pain and motor response. Okay, so please know the difference. Analgesics block the pain, but anesthetics block the pain and the motor response. Regional anesthetics block the sensation to a varying degree. Uh, the major advantages is that it allows the woman to still be awake, but yet it provides her some uh, relief. 
Now in here I have a couple of pictures um, within your PowerPoint, the little funny little skit that I put there, the little humor. And then there's also another little picture that shows you the placement of the epidural catheter. Um, and what the catheter looks like once it's been placed into the epidural space and the needle has been removed. You can see that picture um, there as well. Sorry, I'm looking back because you know I have dogs. So sometimes when my doors are moving, here. It could be my dogs pushing the doors open or shut. Um, please make sure that you note figure 7-6. Um, the membrane around the spinal cord are called the meninges and there are uh, layers of the meninges. There's the dura matter, there's the arachnoid matter, and there's the pia matter. Please make sure that you know that there are three layers and what those layers are. The epidural space is located between the dural matter and the inside of the bony prominent, the bony covering of the brain or the spinal cord. That's the epidural space. Is um, located between the dural matter and the uh, arachnoid matter. And the subarachnoid space is located between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. The regional anesthesia in obstetrics usually involve the placement of the anesthetic in the epidural space or the subarachnoid space. Now I'm going to put a link where you guys can watch the um, watch a video of an epidural or a spinal. I'll show you guys where you can find that, where it is best noted. Let's see. Um, oh, let's talk about local infiltration. Um, an example would be injection of the perineal area for an episiotomy before birth. Um, that's a local infiltration. Another is, um, oh, that's the most likely one that you will see. There's a short delay between injection time and the loss of pain sensation there. And there's virtually no risk that the woman is um, not allergic to the drug. If there's virtually no risk if the patient is not allergic to any drug. So they just do a... Um, an injection right at the perineal area um, for an episiotomy. But to be honest, I have seen some physicians do that um, injection even without doing uh, episiotomy to just relieve some of the pain of the stretching of the perineum. Now let's talk about a, a prodental block. It's also known as a saddle block and it's not really used much anymore. Um, I've been doing labor and delivery a long, long time now, and literally uh, within the 18, 20, something like that, years that I've been doing it, um, I have never seen a saddle block. Never. Um, it does not block the pain from contractions. It is injected uh, into the pudental nerve, and it uh, numbs only the perineal area. So, like, to be honest, I don't understand why anybody would do them. That's probably why we don't see them anymore because it's only blocking the pain of the perineal area. Um, and it's not handling any of the pain of the contractions when people can just do a basic uh, infiltration of the peri area and still have the same uh, result. So there's a picture of it within your slides. Um, also, it's on figure 7-8 where you can see that as well. So now let's talk a little bit about an epidural block. It is administered while the woman is sitting up straight to avoid compressions of the epidural space. Um, a small test dose is given to see if the epidural catheter is in the epidural space. And the woman can sometimes ambulate with a low dose of the anesthesia. I, I don't really see that often. I have seen it a couple of times. And it is not used if there is an abnormal blood clotting. 
um, if it's an infection in um, the area around the injection or if there's a patient who is hypovolemia, has hypovolemia, then this patient is not going to be a candidate for an epidural block. It's a, a large needle that is used and it is inserted into the epidural space and the catheter is threaded into the space which uh, the drugs is, are then uh, put through that catheter. A small test dose is done to tell if the catheter is in the right place. Uh, numbness uh, or loss of movement after the test dose probably means the dura matter has been punctured. So we're waiting and we're watching for that. And then also the anesthesiologist or the CRNA will ask the patient questions like, uh, do you feel any numbness around your mouth? Do you have any ringing in your ears? Uh, do you have any visual disturbances at this time? And um, the reason they're asking that, because if they have any of those things noted, it is suggested that the catheter is in a vein and not in the right location. It is not in the space. Um, if the dura matter is punctured, a large amount of spinal fluid can leak um, through, and the result that the patient will have of that is a headache, which we call a spinal headache. Uh, please make note of this, highlight it, write it on a card, whatever you have to do, but you must monitor the blood pressure closely for hypotension after these epidurals. Usually they like to bolus the patients first before we even will place an epidural. You will have an anesthesiologist or a CRNA to tell you, hey, um, how many uh, liters of fluid has she had? Um, and if she hasn't even had a total one, they'll say, okay, flood that one in um, in order for me to do that. And they're telling you that so that they can decrease the chance of this patient having um, some hypotension. Because then if your mom has hypotension, what's going to happen to your fetal heart rate? Your baby's fetal heart rate is going to come down or they're going to start having some variables or some changes in their fetal heart tone and now you're battling to get both of them back up so it's best to do your work on the front side and monitor very closely um, right after you do this epidural um, if the patient does have a spinal leak the CRNA or the anesthesiologist has to come back and do a blood patch after they uh, remove that catheter from that mom um, after the epidural is completed in order to keep um, to seal that over and to relieve her from the spinal headache. The blood patch is done by the anesthesiologist or the CRNA, which is a nurse anesthetist. Uh, the blood is withdrawn from the mother's vein and injected into the epidural space in the area of the puncture. The blood clot um, then forms and seals and that's what stops the spinal fluid from leaking. So that's why um, that really works well for the mom. So let's talk about the subarachnoid block or a spinal block as we like to call them. That's usually one shot block and it doesn't involve placement of a catheter. So some people think that it uh, reminds them of an epidural but it is a uh, spinal it's a one shot no placement of the catheter um, hypotension is often more severe than with the epidural because the medication is just going straight in it's flooding in right away a post uh, spinal headache is possible so uh, the um, so the woman um, are advised of that and they would have a bad headache that goes away when they lie down and it is excruciating when they uh, stand up. So we like to teach them that so that they will know uh, what to tell us, what we're looking for. It used to be thought to lie flat, um, but that's very controversial now. So sometimes we don't tell them to just lie totally flat. Uh, blood press can be performed if the headache does occur for this mother as well. Um, so, um, I've already discussed with you guys what we would be looking for, what would be happening if uh, my mother is hypotensive, and I want you to really get that in your thought and get that in your visual. If the mother's blood pressure is going down and you know that the mother's blood pressure um, is working along with this baby, what are we expecting for the baby to do, okay? 
that baby's heart rate may come down as well. The baby may start having some changes in their baseline changes within their, um, um, like if they're having like some, some different changes in their heart rate. So please make note of a uh, figure seven dash six and do that reading that follows that. Okay, so let's talk about uh, general anesthesia. So we all know general means what? Good night, you are going to sleep. Um, so you will have a total loss of consciousness when you have a general. Um, it is rarely used in a vaginal delivery and sometimes it's used in emergency C-sections. Um, that's the only time I normally see now when we ever use general anesthesia is during um, an emergency C-section. That's the only time that general is used. Um, so let's talk about some adverse effects of pharmacological methods um, that I want you guys to make note of. And we're almost done with this chapter. Um, systemic opioid, we discussed that. Um, it could give the baby fetal respiratory distress. Uh, pudental blocks, with a pudental block, uh, that mom could get a vaginal hematoma. Um, epidural and subarachnoid blocks or spinal blocks. The maternal hypotension and urinary retention are prominent. Uh, the mother can also get a spinal headache with a subarachnoid block. And general anesthesia for the mother. Um, she could aspirate. Um, stomach contents, which is one of the reasons why during assessment, I told you what, you're going to always want to know what the last time they did what, what the, what's the last time they ate, uh, and another, um, um, effect, adverse effect for it, for the fetus is that this baby could have respiratory distress. When possible, foods and fluids are withheld for several hours prior to surgery to prevent aspiration. But unfortunately, if you have a mom that comes in and we get her on the monitor and everything starts clicking away really fast, then we didn't have time to make sure that she uh, remained in PO for a, a certain amount of time. This is why one of the reasons why some physicians do not allow people to eat during their labor um, at all is because we are just really trying to pay attention. We don't know what in fact is going to happen. Uh, we just want a safe delivery for the mother and the baby. So sometimes hard calls are made like, no, you can't eat. Um, so let's talk about the nurse's role uh, when you are medicating a patient for pain during labor. Um, safety is your number one goal. So side rolls up, especially if she is a uh, uh, sleeping, falling asleep, you know, these kind of things. Uh, during a uh, subarachnoid or an epidural block, the blood pressure is measured every five minutes until the blood pressure is stable and the fetal status is monitored as well. Uh, for a general, respiratory status is observed every 15 minutes for one to two hours and her urine output is also monitored. For narcotics, we are going to assess respiratory status, monitor the fetus for changes in their respirations. Um, we're going to um, do um, vital signs for the mom, and we're going to monitor her hourly. Okay. Wait a minute. No. For the, uh, when, after the baby is delivered, we're going to monitor the baby uh, for a while to make sure that they didn't have any changes, like none of the medication crossed the placenta line. So that's what we're monitoring, okay? Please review the nursing care plan. Uh, it's noted under the woman needing pain management during labor. Um, also, it's very, uh, the prudent nurse role is to make sure that she makes sure her patient has a call light um, always next to her, um, that she doesn't leave her alone for, alone for long. If there is a family member that's in the room with them um, during the pain management, that you are changing the position of the patient often um, in order to help her to not maintain one position for the whole labor if she is not able to move on her own. Um, if you give her something like a um, spinal block or an epidural, okay? So that concludes our chapter on the nursing 
um, portion of pain during um, labor and birth. And that is all.